Okay, we are now recording. Um, today is February 9th, 2018, and this is the call sponsored by the Taos Institute um, on Week in Dialogue with the Author. And our guest this week is John Winslade with his book, When Stories Clash, Addressing Conflict with Narrative Mediation. And my name is Dawn Dole, and I am the Executive Director for the Taos Institute. I would like to welcome all of you to this call, this webinar today, and especially to those who participated in the online conversation all week. What a lively and fun conversation was happening on the Taos Institute online learning platform. And welcome to everyone. And I wanna thank John for taking his time this week to share with the group that joined in online and for sharing today um, for this webinar. It's a wonderful book. I absolutely love John's book, John and Gerald's book, and um, hope that all of you got a lot out of it and will continue to get a lot out of it. Um, John is, the, um, is a professor um, <clears throat> at the California State University at San Bernardino in um, the Department of Special Education, Rehabilitation, and Counseling. And he has done some amazing work over the years throughout the world um, and I hope he's able to share some of his stories and successes today on the webinar and um, also engage all of us in a conversation around the, the big concepts in the book, When Stories Clash. And thank you, John, for being here, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Dawn. And thank you for the chance to meet you all. Um, I uh, have enjoyed the um, conversation during the week, and um, particularly um, as, as it's gone backwards and forwards. Um, I know Mark has been uh, very helpful in um, making that conversation go, and many others have as well. Um, what I was thinking about doing today, um, it seems like we have uh, uh, enough people or a small enough group to um, allow um, conversation to happen. Um, so feel free to um, um, bring in any of your perspectives, any thoughts, any questions, any comments along the way. Um, what I would like to do is to um, do pre present to you a, a sort of a summary of what the book was trying to do. And um, um, to add some um, different perspectives, some different angles, if you like, on it um, as we go along. I hope that fits with what you um, were expecting. So let me um, put a PowerPoint slide on the screen. Um, Um, you may recognize this, this experience. Um, the sense of being caught up in a conflict um, that is not the same thing as the identity of any one person who's involved in it. If you've had that sense or that um, experience, um, you have just encountered um, what I would refer to as a narrative, because I want to start by um, talking about the concept of narrative a little bit, and um, to then um, talk about the different steps that we might go through in a conflict resolution process. The idea of a narrative has been around a long time, at least since um, Aristotle, this is a photograph of Aristotle that I got from his Facebook page. Um, if you weren't aware of it, Aristotle does have a Facebook page. And he talked about um, uh, what a narrative means from the point of view of literature, especially. So he is responsible for the, the things that we had to learn in school about plots and themes and characters and settings and things like that making up um, um, a narrative. Um, and um, there are different definitions of the concept of 
Um, whoops, sorry, I'm going backwards and forwards there. Um, of what a narrative is. One of them is the, the idea of the fabula and the narrative and distinction, distinguishing between those. In, there are different accounts for what a fabula is. I think of it as being the raw details of a story and a narrative as being an organized account um, that has some features that show that it, is, it has been organized in a particular way. Um, and I think that when people come into mediation, they come with a particular account of what they are experiencing. And so I think it, it becomes something that we need to work with um, if we're going to learn how to um, deal with the conflicts that uh, happen in people's lives. Because out of these narratives that people um, live through, they construct their lives, their relationships, their families, their organizations, their communities. Um, which stories am I talking about? Which narratives, if you like, I'm using the word narrative and the word story relatively interchangeably. They do have slightly different or technical meanings, but um, for our purposes, we can actually use them in, in an interchangeable way. A lot of people say to me things like, yeah, I'm interested in narratives because I'm interested in the stories people tell in mediation. Um, and that is of course of interest, but um, a narrative perspective is much more than simply um, the stories that people tell. Um, it's to do with the stories that they tell themselves as well as the ones that they tell others. And it's also to, to do with the background um, cultural stories that influence their, their um, experience that they get from all kinds of different places. And I've represented those with some different little um, images, if you like. One of the things that um, um, happened when we first published, Gerald Monk and I first published a book on narrative mediation was that we got a review which said, this is all very um, well, but it's very dense. It's all very interesting, but it's too, too complex. Um, and ever since um, reading that review, I've been trying to um, find simpler and simpler ways to um, represent what a narrative perspective is about. Um, the book that the Taos Institute asked us to write is in, in, in effect one of those um, efforts, if you like, to simplify it, to make it accessible, to make it more easily understood. But this is my attempt to do it in one slide. Um, in three sentences. First of all, in conflict, people often feel caught up in a story that is painful and they're not happy about it. Um, you'll notice there that that, um, that sentence suggests a gap between the person and who's been caught up and the story that they're, they're telling and the fact that they're not happy about it. If they are not happy, if they are happy about it, they can go ahead and carry on and there's no need for some kind of mediation, but it's only if they're not happy about it that they might want to change it. The second sentence, they would prefer the relationship with the other person to be in a different place. That seems fairly obvious. If they're not happy about it, they prefer it to be in a different place. The third sentence is where conflict resolution practices start to happen. Conflict resolution involves separating from the conflict story and growing the story of relationship they would prefer. Um, I want you to see that as being, as being different and distinctive in regard to the problem solving mode of mediation that is still the most common approach to mediation that, that's around. Um, it involves, first of all, um, assuming that there are two stories the conflict story and the story of relationship that they would prefer. And that in itself is a, um, um, a difference between this way of thinking about um, conflict and um, the usual problem solving mode that has people resolving the conflict story and getting towards some kind of resolution that way. 
Um, if we think about the question, what is the goal? Um, again, um, I want to make a distinction between how we've thought about conflict resolution in a narrative sense and how it is sometimes thought about in a problem solving sense. First of all, it involves helping people to separate from the conflict story um, and identify a counter story of a different kind of relationship. Um, and from there to um, um, work towards a, a reauthoring of the relationship story first and then to go through negotiation. Um, what I mean by that is um, to establish a relationship story that enables people to actually work together um, and from there negotiate within the, um, with, from within the counter story. What often happens in mediation is that people tell their story and then they are asked to start negotiating before there is a relationship story established. And that sometimes I think leads to a reluctant or a, um, a um, hesitant approach to the negotiation and people kind of sometimes grudgingly uh, move towards negotiating rather than um, and smoothly moving that direction. Whereas if we do it the other way around, if we start with re, um, reauthoring the relationship story um, um, and building, say, a story of cooperation or um, mutual understanding or peacefulness or whatever it might be, and then from there work within, within the spirit of that story towards some kind of counter story, um, then I think the the um, negotiation happens much more effectively and much more smoothly. Um, now I've also taken some um, principles from Gilles Deleuze, and Deleuze um, had a, 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 a statement that he made, um, which was a major part of his work, and. It is summarized in the statement the the event is logically prior to identity. Um, it was part of um, a major thrust in particularly in the logic of sense book, but in many other places in his work as well. What he meant by this is, I think, don't look for a category of person. Don't put people into categories and ask what that type of person would do as often happens when people are dealing with conflict in various ways. And then from the point of view of the, com of the category, you use that to explain um, um, what happens and why people do what they do. In other words, that would be, starting with a category would mean starting with the identity that people have and, and looking for, for how they are identical to that category. For example, um, describing somebody as being aggressive or having a borderline personality or two people as being in a personality conflict. Each of those things um, puts people into some category first and then tries to use that to explain the um, conflict that they are uh, engaged in. Deleuze is suggesting that we start the other way around. Start with the event. Um, and think about how that is logically prior, um, and by the way, Deleuze um, to identity, and by the way, Deleuze um, offered a philosophical proof, so it's more than just an opinion, it's, a, it's an argument um, about why that might be the case. I think what Deleuze was saying is pretty similar to what Michael White was suggesting when he was talking about the person is not the problem, the problem is the problem. But the stories that we tell, the narratives that people um, exchange or live from, um, have to be made up out of language. And because they are made out of language, um, they are infused with discourse. Discourse is the term that uh, Michel Foucault developed to describe um, the content as well as the process of, um, of talk, of language, of use of language. 
And by discourse, he, he used the term in, in a number of different ways, but what he was basically doing was um, developing the, a sense of the meaning of the word discourse to refer to taken for granted truths which become patterned. Um, and discourse is not possessed by any one person, so it doesn't make any sense to talk about an individual person's discourse. It's actually produced by a, um, a community of people over a period of time. And then it gradually gets, becomes internalized into the thoughts on, and feelings of a particular person so that they come to believe that what they are saying is their own. Um, so here's some examples of, of discourses. Many examples of discourse can be quite uncontroversial. Um, but they can be represented, as Foucault argued, as a statement. Um, for example, a man should be the head of the household. That's a piece of discourse that is um, hotly contested in many ways. I'm not um, supporting it or advocating for it. I'm just saying that that is part of a discourse that if you're doing divorce mediation, for example, is um, something that has to be grappled with. Um, the second one is about racism. White privilege is based on natural superiority. That is part of the, the um, belief that has driven colonization ar around the world for the past uh, several hundred years. Um, and it, it um, introduces the concept of race from, from the start. Um, incidentally, um, if you look at the history of racism, if you look at the history of the concept of race, it was um, racism that generated, I think, the, um, the, the, the modern concept of race, not the other way around. It wasn't that we, we had the concept of race and then thought about it in a biased way. It was actually originally from the start, um, colonization was driven by um, an assumption of natural superiority. One of the um, examples that I sometimes cite to prove that is the, um, the um, diary that was written by Christopher Columbus when he, was, when he visited the New World. On the first day on, on the island of Hispaniola, which is now um, Haiti in the Domin Dominican Republic, um, and that it was um, populated by the Arawak people who no longer exist. There were about 200,000 people there. Um, and Columbus wrote on, on his first day in the new world, he wrote, these people will make very good servants because he assumed that he was naturally superior to them and that they would be, um, under his, and, um, his colleagues, um, superior rule. A similar statement about homosexuality, that it is not natural, has been a piece of discourse that has again been contested um, widely, but it still exists and um, still has to be um, articulated, um, or opposition to it needs to be articulated. If we start to talk about those co more controversial statements, we start to see that, that um, power becomes part of the exchange of discourse um, and Foucault was very interested in how power works not because he was particularly obsessed with power although a lot of people think that is the case um, but because he wanted to show how power in the modern world is based a lot more on the kinds of um, discourse exchanges that people go through so he talked about how power was not a commodity, but a property of a relation. That's a very hard concept to get our heads around because he talked about it, um, uh, because many people talk about power as something that people hold. That is, um, is that makes it into a commodity and into something that people, an object, if you like, that people can hold. But for Foucault, power was more productive than repressive. Um, it wasn't, um, always um, a negative thing, and he talked about it as being sometimes positive, um, but also um, dangerous. By positive, he he was more meaning that um, that people 
use power or, or construct power in ways that um, produce people's lives rather than stop them from having a particular kind of life. Um, and I think in mediation that everybody comes to a conflict situation with a desire to influence others. And that's really what power is about. So I think it's useful to think about mediation as being the difference between um, different viewpoints that people are wanting to influence others to come, come to. This does not have to be domination. And Foucault made a distinction between power and domination. Um, if power is in his famous statement <coughs> about the actions of, upon the actions of others, then we are always trying to do that. Um, but when we restrict the possibility for other people to also use power in return, that's when domination starts to happen. So with those kind of um, background uh, features, I want to start by talking about um, different tasks that might go towards conflict resolution. And um, I'm going to basically talk about three different tasks um, for conflict resolution. And the first task is um, about understanding the conflict story. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I've got a bit of a cold. Um, the first task of conflict resolution is listening. Um, and that's not a surprise to anybody. Listening for what though? Listening for what happened is the first task. Um, what's happened between the people? When, when did it happen? Um, is part of the, what we need to listen to. And Deleuze also suggests that um, any event we saw before his idea that um, an event is logically prior to identity, but he also saw an event as being part of a series. Um, in other words, um, any event needs to be understood in terms of what has preceded it and what will succeed it. And what has preceded it is going to be a series of different kind of events. Um, many of which actually help to produce the, um, the story that is part of the conflict, but, um, but it is not, it is that while they um, have some kind of causal link, it's a kind of a semi-causal link. It's, a, it's not a logical, well-developed um, causal explanation. It's more just to, because it is part of a series that it, that it um, starts to influence what happens. Then you've got people involved and people have desires and they have beliefs and they contribute to what happened. Um, and understanding the, those things, people's desires and beliefs is, is part of the first task of conflict resolution. As uh, understanding the background concepts, meanings, discourses, or Deleuze's phrase, the images of thought, which were built into what happened. And then he talks about sense. Um, Deleuze regards sense as being um, something that is uh, that makes all the other things hang together. And by sense, he's talking more about sensation than about meaning. Um, the word sens in French, I think, refers to um, sensation more than it does to, as it does in English, to the word meaning. So um, when we're trying to de develop an externalizing conversation, I think it's useful to have a, the, the, the um, sense, if you like, of what is driving the whole conflict story. Um, this is a slide which I have um, used to describe the kind of experiences that re represents the kind of experiences that people have when they're um, telling you um, a story of what a conflict is about. You'll see that the um, the red um, squares represent negative experiences that people have gone through. And the brown ones, more positive experiences. When they tell a conflict story, they're going to make a connection between and join up the, um, the red squares 
and the brown ones you'll see remain um, unstoried or unconnected um, and therefore they they don't actually become things that people pay attention to because they are isolated events or singularities in Deleuze's terms. The task eventually in, in conflict resolution is going to be to build a counter story which actually makes connections between the um, things which otherwise were lying unconnected. And you'll notice that they are picking up some of the white um, squares or circles or ovals. Um, and they're um, also um, including those in the um, account of the story which is gradually being developed. Um, I mention this because um, it's necessary when we're doing conflict resolution work to um, um, build something and it takes time to build it rather than to just assume that one exception is going to lead to some kind of change. The second task of conflict resolution is a deconstructive one. Um, this involves hearing multiple stories or double listening, um, listening for power relations or Deleuze's term was lines of force, um, loosening the authority of assumptions. And I think that's sometimes enough. It doesn't have to be completely deconstructing them um, as some kind of philosophical or sociological exercise sometimes deconstructing is just a matter of loosening the authority of something um, externalizing conversation is part of that i'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute um, and um, because it is deconstructive as is tracing the effects of a problem or mapping the effects and all of this is actually um, driven by the concept of curiosity um, curiosity, I think, is really, really important, and just staying, staying curious is a way of um, um, effecting a deconstructive type of conversation. Let me talk a little bit about double listening. Uh, it's based on the assumption that there is always a conflict story and there will always be a counter story of a different kind of relationship. Conflict resolution in the end is about accessing the different story and asking people which one they would prefer. Let me pause it at this moment and um, tell you a brief story. Um, this is a story that we used when we were developing narrative mediation quite a bit. And I still find it a useful story to, um, to tell. It actually comes from Michael White's work. And it was a, about a couple who came to see him one day and they walked into his office and just started to argue and he didn't even have a chance to introduce himself. They just started to argue in, in the start of the conversation. So he decided to listen. And after 10 minutes, um, he managed to get a word in 10 minutes of arguing on their part. And he, this is what he said. He said, um, thank you very much for, um, demonstrating the problem. It won't be necessary, however, for ongoing demonstrations. And they paused for a moment and they went straight back to arguing. And um, Michael got to speak about a few minutes later in which he, um, he said to them, I'm not sure that I made myself clear, but it, it, it really is not necessary to do ongoing demonstrations of the problem story. Um, and they went straight back to arguing again. And he said the same thing four times. And after the fourth time, they stopped. And he said to them, do you mind if I ask you a few questions? And he said, they agreed to that. And um, he said, that pattern of interacting, is it working for you? Is it? And they said, no, it isn't. It's just, it's very frustrating. And it, so he said, um, that pattern of interacting, is it something that suits you? Does it, does it um, suit the kind of people that you are, the kind of relationship that you have? And again, they disagreed and didn't um, see it as being um, part of who they were. And they were talking about it being very frustrating. Um, 
And Michael asked him a few questions about the effects of that pattern of interacting. And then he went on to say to them, so what would you prefer? And they, they actually named it as being something that they wanted. That, that, that took a little bit of coaxing, but they came out with the idea that they, what they needed was a, um, a civil conversation between them. And the civil conversation, Michael said, tell me what that would look like if I was to see it so that I could recognize it if you were having one. Um, and the interesting thing was that the, the civil conversation or the conversation they were having um, that they were describing was very similar to the to the one that, that that was happening right now because they were not no longer in the place of argument and conflict and dispute they were actually um, holding a different kind of conversation and he goes on to say that um, the um, the conversation between them took some many different turns and that wasn't the end of the and the challenges that they had to face but the the um the story of civil conversation which they could actually tell and which they could actually live and do um, and which they preferred became the basis of the conflict resolution pattern that they um, established so that's what i mean when i say accessing a different story and asking which one they would prefer part of doing this is is doing double listening and um, I sometimes am, I sometimes recommend to people that they listen for the word but um, because it often signifies two stories happening uh, that someone is um, referring to. If you take that sentence down the bottom, I was really angry at the time, but I calmed down later. Often people pay attention to the really angry part and say, tell me what you were angry about. But the um, other story there, which is I, I came, calmed down later, has some thinking that goes into it, and that often gets overlooked. Double listening is about not overlooking that. It's about turning the coin over and seeing the other side, and sometimes it means um, some um, responding to what people say by using expressions like on the one hand and on the other hand and recording the, um, or giving people acknowledgement for the um, different viewpoints that they might have and that they might express in the same sentence even. Here's an example of a kind of a, um, exchange that might happen between a mediator and some um, parties, in this case a couple, um, that il illustrates the concept of double listening. I guess when you came here today, you had some sense of hope about what kind of conversation we might have and what it might lead to. Could you speak to that? Now, um, first of all, I want you to notice that the common approach to mediation is to start with defining the problem. This is a, a, a starting place that sometimes I've found useful, which starts not with defining the problem, but defining the counter story, the sense of hope. Um, so Mary responds to it and says, I hope we can have a respectful conversation about our children. I'm sick of arguing. We need to talk things through before it gets worse. If you listen carefully to what Mary says there, there are two things. One is the, the problem story, the story about arguing, but the story about it getting worse. Um, and the other one is this, the counter story, the story of respectful conversation and talking things through. Um, and I think um, if we're going to be um, listening carefully, we need to hear both of those things. Mediator says, um, Sorry, somebody wanting to speak? Lydia says, I'm interested in your hope for respectful conversation. Help me understand why that is important for you. You notice that the question why is most useful when you're talking about a counter story because it helps people to step further into it. 
and to justify it and to explain it. Um, I personally don't want to use the word why to help people to explain or justify a problem story because that's strong enough as it is. Um, Mary says it's important that the children don't just see us fighting. They've seen enough of that and it's been affecting them. They're both showing signs of insecurity and we need to work together to make things stable for them. Again, you'll notice there are two different stories there. One of them involves fighting, being affected by the conflict, showing signs of insecurity. That's the, the problem story. And the other story is the one of um, them having seen enough of that and we need to work together and make things stable for them. Then George is brought into the conversation by the mediator. Is that important to, to you too, George, or do you have some other hopes for what we might do here today? George says, I don't want the children to suffer either. I came here to sort out some arrangements so that we don't have to slug it out in court. It's also, it's, it's so demeaning and also expensive. We can do better. On this occasion, I um, used color to actually indicate the two stories. The blue stories, the blue words are the ones that indicate um, the problem story and the red ones are the ones that indicate the, the counter story. So I hope that illustrates, if you like, something of the idea of double listening. Um, the next thing to refer to is the concept of externalizing conversation. Um, this involves speaking about the conflict as a third party. Um, externalizing conversation is used in narrative therapy and sometimes people use, use it to, to um, externalize things like emotions. Um, personally, I find it more useful to, to ex develop an externalizing conversation about situations and um, the conflict, the argument, the dispute and so on um, is a, a, an easy um, a form of externalizing to use. If you can't use that, something like that, then just use the word it. Um, and then that externalizing conversation is maintained and developed by the use of, of questions about the effects of the conflict. What um, externalizing conversation does is it helps people save face because it, it makes the conflict into the problem, not the other person. And people are very usually very quick to um, blame the other rather than to um, um, blame the conflict itself. So blame is interrupted by this, this way of speaking and it, it helps people to disidentify from them, themselves or from the other person being the problem person. Here's some examples of things that might be said. What might we, we what, what might we call this thing that we're up against? Is it an argument, a dispute, a disagreement, or what? What would you call it? How did it get caught, you caught up in the conflict? How long has it been going? When did it start? What was it like before that? Does it get you to do or say things against your better judgment? Notice the double listening involved there in the expression against your better judgment, which was one of the reasons why it's actually a, a very useful question to ask. How does it persuade you to think about the other person? Notice the difference there between just how do you think about them to how does it persuade you to think? Very um, carefully designed questions that um, make for a subtle difference in the experience of people when they're responding to them. Then you go on by exploring the effects of the conflict or of it. And um, personally, I find it useful to remember length, breadth and depth. Um, length refers to time. Uh, it's easy to, uh, it's e easier to, to do this because I think length, breadth and depth are easy to remember. Length refers to time. How long has it been going? What would happen in the future? If it was to keep going, what's it doing right now? Breadth is to do with domains of living. Is this a conflict that affects you at work or at, at school or at home 
Um, or does it, come, does it follow you home? Does it follow you to work? Um, so breadth is to do with things like um, work and home and social life and finances and customer relations and um, whatever the, the um, situation might be about that the conflict um, is part of. Depth is to do with how bad it is, how serious it is, how severe it is, how painful it is. Is it a minor an annoyance? Is it an irritation? Or is it a really um, um, deep-seated, painful exchange? So um, the effects of the conflict, um, people um, who have a background in therapy often um, focus in on the emotional aspects. But there are also thoughts and there are also actions that people um, do. They, they um, avoid each other. They um, stop something from escalating. Um, those are actions that people might take. Um, when I'm talking about domains of living, I'm, I think it makes a difference um, what, you're, what kind of mediation you're involved in. If you're involved in a family mediation, for example, it's much more kind of to do with personal relationships. If it's a staff conflict in a workplace scenario, then you're much more likely to be talking about staff morale and business and customer relations and profit lines and things like that. Um, and I think it's, it's something that mediators need to be careful with um, when they're um, involved in um, mediations in those kind of contexts. So, like, um, when I say careful, I think there's an ethical principle involved of not actually encouraging people to um, speak personally to things that would become ammunition for the other party to hurt them with if the mediation was not to be successful. So I think we need to be a, a little bit careful about that. Um, if the mediation, if sorry, if the conflict was to keep on getting worse, where might things end up? That sometimes is a, a horrifying thought for people. Um, and that's sometimes a motivation to um, resolve it. Um, and one of the easiest questions, but one of the most effective ones to ask is what else? It can be followed up with any of the ones before. So I think time spent mapping the effects is actually very worthwhile and very useful. Um, um, uh, very useful time spent in the um, development of a motivation for a counter story. Here's some examples of the kinds of questions that might be asked. What does it get you to feel or think? Notice it's different from what is it, what do you feel or think? What effect has it had on your body? Conflicts often have powerful effects on people's uh, physical experience, whether it is um, lack of sleep or um, headaches or stomach aches or um, nausea or um, other things like that. Um, I think it's really important to acknowledge and to notice those, those things. How does it affect relationships? Um, what else does it affect? Could it get worse? And, what, and the final question there, what do you think of it having these effects? Is it okay or not? And if not, why not? That takes the conversation towards a counter story, which leads us into the third task of conflict resolution, growing the counter story. Um, how does the series of events fit with what's important to you? Um, that's a question which might um, fit with Michael White's idea of the statement of position map. It invites people to evaluate the conflict story um, and to um, and its effects, and to um, assess how it fits with what's important to them. What would you prefer? That is a question that neatly follows from that. Have there been have there been any times more like what you would prefer? Um, I've called that a line of flight, um, which is Deleuze's term. It might also be thought of as a counter story as well here, or an entry point to a counter story. Um, how does it fit with your values? 
Um, that assumes that people have identified an answer to the previous question. Um, that there may have been times that are more like what they would prefer. My, my experience is that people um, always struggle at first to answer those kind of questions. They usually cannot think of times that have been more like what they would prefer until you um, keep on asking them um, and persist a little bit at that point. And because what well, it's, it's understandable that people would not be able to think of those things because they are, because the, the, their consciousness has been dominated by the conflict story at that point. Um, when you ask questions that enable them to go back to the past or forward into the future, I like to think of that as being about time travel. Questions that invite them to move through time back to the past and to the, to the future. And I, I also think that um, the world of um, psychology has, has developed a, a favoring of the, um, the present moment as being the place where most things change. I actually think that it's actually more helpful to think in Deleuze's terms where he talked about how time is something that is, um, um, that there, there are two different kinds of time. There's chronos and there's eon. In the f field of chronos, which is um, the, the um, usual way of thinking about time, um, the, the present moment is distinctive. It's cut off from the past and the present. It's a, there's a discrete difference between them. And um, in terms of eon, the, the, the past and the present and the, and the future all become part of the same flow, um, which enables us to do time travel more easily. And Deleuze's argument was that people move backwards and forwards between these two uh, ideas about time according to what is useful to them. However, um, the world of Kronos has become so dominant that we've l lost track of that ability of seeing um, time as being something that is more fluid. So how do you open a counter story? Well, there are many different ways. Sometimes a counter story will simply present itself. Um, but if it doesn't, you can actually use this um, model to actually help um, generate it. So we've talked about this tension and what it is doing to you and to others. What do you think of that? Is it okay with you? Does it fit with what you would hope, what you would want for your life, what you would prefer? Each of those questions puts people in the position, not the mediator, but the parties themselves in the position of evaluating the conflict and um, if it's done well, you often get agreement at that point between both parties actually um, evaluating it as something that they want to change. I remember doing a mediation once between two groups of nurses and um, in the middle of it, um, one man, um, they were having a territorial dispute about different areas of, um, of work that they um, were, were overlapping with and they um, were we're arguing with each other about who was to do what. One man in the end, in the in the middle of that said, "This is ridiculous. I've been I've been I realised that I've been dreaming about this every night, and that's got to stop." So, um, he was at that moment evaluating the conflict as being something that he didn't want to continue, and that became the mo motivation towards some kind of counter story that that might follow. It can be followed up by asking the question, why? Why not? Why would you not prefer it? Why would you want, does it not fit with what you would hope? Um, why does it not what you want for your life? Which invites people to justify the evaluation. From there, you can build on the opening. What would you prefer? What would that look like? Can you think of examples? And when you think of an example, what was different then? I mean, can you give me another example? Again, curiosity is um, critical. Um, 
On the other hand, um, openings to a counter story can just present themselves. Someone, for example, might offer an, an apology um, as an uh, action that is a generous effort to make um, response to another person. When such a, uh, moments occur, they are openings to a different story. Um, Michael White and David Epstein called them unique outcomes. They can be called events in terms of Deleuze's terms, or they can be called exceptions in terms of Steve DeShazer and Insu Kimberg's terms. Um, and they might be events, they may be particular makings of meaning that people have. They might also be small differences in how people respond, and they might be about there might be things that we can actually ask more questions about to if they don't tell us what the differences are we can ask what difference does that make we can also ask questions about the background knowledges that they're calling on to make those differences and um, um, people's values hopes and dreams are also tied up in the things that they um, might um, believe to be part of a counter story all of those things are strengthened if we ask more questions about them. This is a photograph of Jerome Brunner, who um, actually died a couple of years ago. I think he was about 101 at the time. Um, and Brunner developed two concepts about narrative. He uh, also, he um, referred to Aristotle and he talked about how um, um, stories or narratives have two different landscapes, one of action and one of meaning. Um, once we identify um, the, the uh, landscape of action and the landscape of meaning or the landscape of consciousness, he called it sometimes, we can ask questions about them to help grow a story. Whenever somebody says something about an event, um, we can ask, what does it mean? We can ask people to go to a different la uh, landscape that of where themes are developed. Or we can ask if, if people tell you about a meaning that if they're talking about, say, peace or hope or um, cooperation or something like that, we can ask them about an example of that. And they can search for that example somewhere in their experience. Um, and that way, as we move between landscapes of action and meaning, um, the story gradually moves and becomes fleshed out, becomes thicker in um, Clifford Goetz's terms. So um, this is basically the um, summary that I want to offer, and then I'm going to open it up and, and hear what people have to say. The, th the three steps um, that are involved um, are um, to do with exploring the story of what happened or listening to the conflict story, deconstructing the conflict story and building a counter story. When we build a counter story, we're opening, if you like, a line of flight in Deleuze's terms. And Deleuze also talked about how um, as we build this line of flight, we're folding new things into the, um, into the um, experience of people sometimes a name, sometimes a history, sometimes a future, and often a differentiation between what has existed. So, um, let me come back to the, um, so that you can see me back to the gallery. Um, I'm wondering if anyone would like to um, unmute themselves and tell us, tell us something about their responses, any thoughts that you have, any um, um, questions that people would like to ask and so on. Uh, yeah, John, I, this is I, Madeline, let me just say, I would invite everyone that's on video to bring your video back so we can see you and we're all in the room together. You may also use the chat for questions and thoughts. I'll keep an eye on the chat, John, and, and see if things are coming up that way too. Okay. 
There's also a raise your hand feature. If you if somebody's talking or asking a question and, and you have something that you want to add, you can use the raise your hand feature um, that's part of your window. Okay, sorry, Madeline, go ahead. No, that's quite all right, Dawn. Those are important uh, logistics. Uh, John, I really appreciated the breadth of what you talked about and all the, the voices that you brought into this conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious as to whether you're familiar with the work of Paul Costello, who worked under Michael White and has done a lot of work on narrative practice. He's actually a Taos Institute associate. I think I have met Paul Costello. Um, I'm not very familiar with his work, but I know a little bit about, about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I'll connect the two of you. You, you would have a great deal to, to say. He's, he, he's working a lot right now on maps uh, of stories. Okay. Great, thank okay. you, John. Thank you. Who else would like to respond? Hello. Kane, is it? Can you unmute yourself, Kane? Yes, there we go. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, come to this, uh, not because I'm so interested in mediation, but I'm interested in deepening my understanding of narrative practice, and I feel incredibly enriched by this presentation. I, I just want to say that. <laughs> um, and um, you know, my, I don't know if you remember, my daughter Caroline was in your program just briefly about a year ago, John. She really uh, appreciated you and, and your wife. So just a, a personal note there. But thank you so much. I don't have a, a question. I, I feel that you've given so much here that I am uh, <clears throat> I'm resonating with it, with uh, what's happening with some of the work I'm doing with my clients. Um, and which I'm, I'm using uh, core narrative practice with them and seeing really marvelous results. And uh, this is just sort of broadening the discourse, you know, because when you talk about the problem, everything that you've really talked about is also applicable to just being in the consultation room with, with a client. So uh, my broader response is thank you and thank you and thank you thank you Kane. i appreciate that hi john um mark here yeah. that was a great overview thank you very much for that um a couple of things that come to mind just running with things you, you briefly mentioned in your presentation i think early on you mentioned that this is not a particularly, it's not a dominant model in the world of mediation. And I was wondering, you know, I don't have a good overview of, you know, how narrative mediation fits in with other techniques. And you talked about more problem solving oriented techniques. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just interested to know like how you see this fitting in that broader picture. And, and if it's not um, getting the traction that you think it deserves, and it seems like a, fantastic approach um, why that is and then a second question that came to mind is um, part of the narrative mediation has this view of uh, the stories of the culture around the person um, is sort of uh, holding and uh, you you mentioned for example how in you know in, in our culture at the moment I'm not sure what I mean by our actually, because there's a lot of people in the room, I don't know where they're all from. Um, but there's a, a focus on Cronus. And, I, and the question that came to mind is, you know, are you aware of this type of approach being applied into very different cultural contexts? I don't, like an example might be, instead of say a English speaking Western environment, I live, I'm living in France, or maybe you could go further afield into Asia or Africa or South America. It would be fascinating to hear your comments on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Well, I, um, I, I do agree that the dominant Western viewpoint is based on the um, assumption that the individual is the center of the universe. And um, that assumption is so widely he he held 
and is so widely um, recognized as being part of the, the um, background assumptions out of which lots of things are, are thought about, that it becomes very difficult to actually counter it. Um, and for that reason, um, narrative um, approaches and anything that is um, counter to that, that dominant way of thinking um, is, it, it sort of is on the back foot a little bit in terms of being able to get recognition and traction. Um, on the other hand, it becomes part of why um, these approaches are powerful and are actually useful because they are countercultural, because they are counter um, to the dominant way of thinking. So um, I don't want to um, speak for other cultural contexts. Um, I think other people need to do that. Um, um, I'm living in California, I'm from New Zealand, um, and I'm in many ways trying to establish a, a response to what has been um, the, the dominant um, way of thinking and the way of practicing in the mediation field um, in those places. Um, I've done a lot of work in Denmark, for example. I've also been in, um, in, in touch with the, the way in which the same kind of ideas are part of the, the world of um, European thought as well in that part of the world. Um, so, but it, it is a challenge to actually um, get um, anything that is different recognized in the same way um, as the problem solving mode because the problem solving mode which basically uh, assumes that any kind of conflict is results from somebody not having their ind individual interests met. Um, it will be um, successful at um, maybe resolving conflict, but it was not gonna, it's gonna leave the, the dominant worldview um, intact. And that's the problem with it. Um, so um, I thank you, Mark, for raising those questions. Um, but I think um, anything that is um, going to run counter to those those um, dominant perspectives is going to struggle. When we first started developing narrative mediation, one of the things that we were responding to were various critiques that were around in the field at the time. This was in the 1990s. And um, of those critiques, in particular, there was a feminist critique, and there was also um, a, a cultural critique. In New Zealand at the time, it was picked up by um, a lot of Maori um, people who would um, who would say, like the feminists did, that um, that um, mediation um, may be achieve certain things, but it leaves intact patriarchy, it leaves intact um, cultural domination, and it doesn't actually um, um, offer any kind of alternative to those things. And that's what we were seeking to, um, um, to emulate, if you like, or to um, bring about. Um, some way of thinking, some way of acting, some way of practicing that would um, give uh, further opportunities for people um, to um, challenge the dominant ways of thinking. Let me leave it at that for now. All right, we have a comment from Richard. Richard, you can unmute. Yes, thanks. Um, hey, Richard. Uh, hello. And thank you very much, John, and uh, other contributors for your for your comments and thought. They uh, they accord very much with um, with my experience, and very much uh, my experience comes from the realm of the body and from the a word like sense as making uh, sense. Um, my work for the last uh, I'm, I'm a theater director for uh, for the last twenty five years. I've worked. Um, 
in communities, mm -hmm. um, inviting the stories of uh, people across lines of difference, and uh, then creating a large performance out of this that babes in arms to you know nonogenarians and uh, you know folks of every kind of ability participate in specifically as a way for us to stand inside of each other's stories. Um, and, uh, and recently, um, working under the name StoryBridge, which was a book we, we wrote, my colleagues and I, including uh, folks who I think are well known to Taos, uh, Juanita Brown and David Isaacs, um, who were co-authors of that. They started World Cafe um, several years ago. Um, what we have um, uh, have noticed is that this backfootedness of um, of programs, which might, unlike Western models, um, encourage um, a, a kind of we thinking, um, that there is a shift in consciousness which we're noticing. By the way, especially in the Northwest, where we seem to be doing a lot of work these days, but but equally in in um, in very challenged communities in places like uh, rural Eastern Kentucky, um, we're we're realizing that um, that folks are, are are strongly attracted to opportunities in which they're able to utilize story as a way of creating a. Um, multiple, multiply voiced narrative that is descriptive of the situation of their lives and which is empowering because of the nature of strengths that it finds beyond the challenges which, um, of which I think really great stories, stories I think as a tool of survival it always has been. Um, so, um, yeah, I just wanted to accord that in, and add this final uh, thought. Um, one of the things that we've noticed very strongly is, uh, is this, that in using theater, using performance as a way of dealing with conflict gives us an interesting opportunity. And I, I've not done a lot of uh, conflict mediation. I've worked some with the Association um, for Dispute Resolu Resolution of Northern Col or California, ADRNC, recently did a, a race uh, piece with them. But, but one of the things that I've noticed is that working with theater, we, we treat conflict like this. So let's say that I'm um, engaged in a scene with a person who's a racial other and, and we're working as two actors to impart the story of our community. It may be my own experience, it may be the other, it may be someone else's experience that I'm representing. But the way that we intensify that performance, drive home its point, is by upping the, 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 the stakes in the confrontation. So that in a sense we get angrier, more heated, um, more emotionally involved. And that this process of doing that actually finally turns us into of something like dancers who are working choreographically to, to, to together create a powerful effect. And even when the issue of the conflict is not worked out, when a counter story isn't written per se, its emotional trace accomplishes much the same thing. When we fall in love with someone, we will find a way to accommodate them in the world and processes like that standing inside each other's stories help us do that i'll stop there okay well thank you richard um i'm not so familiar with the world of theater but i appreciate that it is different from the con field of um mediation and conflict resolution in itself but um i'm interested in what you're saying about um how conflict is intensified and that becomes part of the building of the possibility of a counter story I have tended to work on a slightly different kind of assumption, which is that um, um, basically the idea of separating from conflict stories rather than intensifying them. Um, and that separating from them opens up the possibility of in intensifying the counter story rather than intensifying the conflict story. Um, so um, um, I, uh, but again, that may be because theatre is a, a different world or a different um, way of doing things than, than what I've been familiar with.
I, I don't disagree at all. I think what happens is that a counter story emerges, perhaps not out of looking at why, for instance, this um, uh, I might be representing a, a white person who is protesting a, a black civil rights march 30 years ago in a story um, from a small town in Georgia. Um, well, I may not go back and change my feelings about that. What changes, what new narrative which emerges is I'm standing in a room with people black and white. We are working together to tell this powerful story about um, this uh, civil rights march. And in the process, all the people in it and I sense that, you know, um, what, what they call ensemble in theater. What we're doing is creating a narrative that is inclusive, that alters our feelings, our, our, our sense about one another. Um, and I think while it may not change the original story, it's emerging a narrative, a new narrative in which we, in which we all can stand. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Richard, that gives me a real, real deeper understanding. That's not very good English, sorry. A deeper <laughs> understanding of uh, that word sense that you mentioned at the beginning. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Richard, you may be interested too in the work of um, 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 David Hooker. David Hooker did a PhD that I um, was involved with for the Taos Institute, in fact. Um, but he took a, um, an event that took place in um, a town that, in North Carolina. And um, there was a, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the name of the town offhand, but um, there was a, an event in which Ku Klux Klan members um, brought guns along to a, 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 a protest that was being held by um, a, a, some unions and um, several people were killed. And this event has um, was later on, you know, uh, had a play written about it, and the theatre perf company performed the play. Um, and what happened was that um, he did his PhD on the um, on the um, use of this play um, twenty or thirty years later to um, bring together community leaders from both groups of um, of the community. Um, to watch the play and then to have, hold a conversation afterwards about what they um, made of what they had seen, which was a very um, creative piece of research, I thought. Because then they, they recorded the um, and made a film of the conversation that, that took place um, after the play. So I think um, theatre can have a very powerful role in... Um, in um, um, changing the um, overall narrative in a community about what happens. That was a good ex example of that, I, I thought. John, Thank I you. put the link up on the chat. If anybody wants to see the dissertation, it's on the chat. Thank you so much. And a lot of this work is being done in, uh, especially in small rural communities, utilizing their own stories as a way to bootstrap themselves since that kind of animation can contribute greatly to their um, um, the community's uh, revitalization. Thank you, yeah. Thank you, Dawn, for putting that up there. Other thoughts, questions, comments, stories? Hi, Dawn, it's Francis. Um, John, thank you. This has been really interesting. I really appreciate it. I've enjoyed using your book in my coaching practice quite a bit. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more, if you don't mind, about the two different concepts of time. Can, can you say that again? Francis, can you say yeah, that again? Thank you. My phone keeps going in and out of muting. I don't know why. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about the two concepts of time, uh, chronic and eon, and, and how you use that and weave that into your into your work. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, um, first of all, Lorraine, my wife, and I have written about um, this topic in a book called "The Crafting of Grief." 
Um, but um, in a way, um, Kronos and Eon, Deleuze talks about these as being different ways of thinking about time and how people shift backwards and forwards between the two quite commonly. I, um, I think people um, are quite skillful at um, shifting between Kronos and Eon. And if you like, um, the focus on Kronos has been part of the modern world um, very, very strongly. We, ha we have it in the, in the whole field of um, um, mindfulness, for example. Um, which is very popular. And, I, and what I like about what Deleuze talked about was that neither of these is correct. Neither of these is, is the only way or something to be advocated for. We actually need both of them. Um, um, but Eon is the one which is more um, slightly difficult to get a hold of, um, slightly more unusual, slightly more um, uh, out of the realm of convention, if you like. If you think about um, um, how time is thought about in the modern world, you can think about someone like Henry Ford, for example, who claimed that history is bunk. Um, he was basically saying at the time that, you know, what we need is um, we don't need history, we just need the present day. We just we, we need, need to focus more on the present. Um, and that's echoed by many people in the, um, the um, technical um, companies, the dot-com companies at the moment, who say similar kinds of things. Um, I think Kronos and Eon are um, distinguished by, particularly by thinking about the the past, the present, and the future as being um, discrete. The past is not the present, and the present is not the future. When you think in terms of eon, actually those things flow together. So um, the present moment is continually constituted by the past, and the future is constantly being built um, out of the past and the present. And, and if you think in terms of eon, then um, everything is subdividable in all kinds of different ways. Um, for example, um, you can think about somebody's life or their career or a relationship as being something that moves through time. It has a past and a present and a future um, all wound up together. This is um, why we wrote about that in the book about grief was that um, um, it bears a lot on remembering conversations. It bears a lot on um, the um, lives of those who are no longer with us um, in body, but they're, 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 the sense of their connection with people who are still alive is still um, powerful, it's still present, it's still part of um, what we live with. Um, in conflict resolution work, um, I think it's actually useful to actually be able to move backwards and forwards through time rather than to be restricted by the requirement to live in the present. Um, how am I doing there, Catherine? Is that kind of... Sorry, it was not Catherine, it was Francis, wasn't it, who was asking about the, the, um, those two things. Am I addressing what you're asking about or not? Yes, absolutely. That's great. So are there any uh, particular questions that, that would um, be particularly useful in this regard if you're, when you're working with somebody? Um, in, in terms of mediation, you mean? Is that what you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Either when you're noticing um, a narrative that is moving more fluidly or when you're noticing that they're they're in the now and you're, you're wanting to get curious about other aspects of time. Well, um, if you're talking about a conflict story and you're deconstructing that, then you might actually be talking about building a sense of the history of it, like when it started, when it began, um, when people noticed that it, that it was there. 
which might also give some sense of when it was not there before that. Mm. Um, but when you're also talking about a counter story, you need to give that some history as well. Um, when did it, when did you notice that? When did it happen? When has it been part of your life before? Um, can you imagine a future in which that is part of how things go? So building a counter story involves giving a strength to the, um, not just to the present moment, but to the sense of history and the sense of a future. Thank um, you. Does that help answer the question about when, about things you can ask? Yes. Uh, yes, I think it also has um, some interesting ideas for, uh, somebody mentioned it earlier that was on the line for when we're working with people from um, different cultures that hold different concepts of time. Right. Mm. Yeah. I agree with that. I'm, I'm, I agree with it, particularly from the experience of um, working with Maori in New Zealand, um, mm -hmm. where the concept of time is very different than the European concept. Mm -hmm. And in particular, um, uh, I learned about that when I went on to a marae, which is a, like a, a, a meeting house, a sacred sort of space where Maori gather for uh, events, funerals, births, uh, weddings, and so on. Um, and um, there are photographs on the walls. But in order to have your photograph on the wall, you have to have died. Mm. Um, people who are alive that is, are, are not um, considered ready yet to be have their photos on the wall. And that's a very different way of thinking about time than um, often happens in a European context. All right, John. Very helpful. Good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We're gonna we're gonna stop here, and I just want to um, thank you so much, John, for taking us through this journey this week uh, with um, on the online conversation with your book, and thank you for. Um, a wonderful webinar today with lots of ideas and, and examples. I just, it's just amazing. And I, I so appreciate you taking your time to do it this week. And thank you all for joining in. Um, the Week in Dialogue with the Author Series is something the Taos Institute does um, throughout the year. And we invite you to just keep an eye on that. If you're not part of the mailing list for our Taos Institute newsletter, uh, be sure to sign up on our website so you can get future information about these um, offerings. And um, if you have questions, email me. I will put the recording of this call up on the Ning, the Taos Institute online learning platform on the page that has the whole week long discussion with John and, and all the other people that joined in this week. Um, and, and again, John, just thank you and thank everyone for being here. And I just want to congratulate John for a great week in, in conversation. So thank you, Dawn, for making this possible. Yeah, you're very welcome. Until next time. Yeah. Yep. See you later, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, John.